eventually captured the slave, Jerry McHenry, and jailed him. But later that night, a group of abolitionists broke McHenry out of jail and helped him make his way to freedom in Canada. This event became widely known as the Jerry Rescue. But that was just the beginning of Horace McGuire's story. He would go on to work for Frederick Douglass at the North Star here in Rochester. Later in life, he would actually recall a meeting between Douglass and the infamous J John Brown just shortly before John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Then in 1862, McGuire gave up a hard earned scholarship to the University of Rochester to enlist alongside his brother in the New York, in the 18th New York Battery, widely known as Max Battery. He was shipped south to Louisiana where he spent most of the Civil War, ultimately rising to the 
rank of commander in the U.S. Colored Artillery. McGuire survived the war, and he returned to Rochester in 1866, where he became a prominent lawyer and a public servant. But these are just the highlights. Come on and walk with me, and we're going to take a walk back in time and learn a little bit more about McGuire and the time that he lived in. I ask you all to please stay behind me during our walk, and we'll uh, catch up with you in a few minutes. an abolitionist i glory in the name though now by slavery's minions hissed and covered o'er with shame it is the spell of might and power the watchword of the free who spends it in the trial hour the craven soul is he I am an abolitionist, then urge me not to pause, for joyfully do I enlist in freedom's sacred cause. The noble strife, the worldness, all been slave to disenthrall. I am a soldier for the war, whatever may befall. I am an abolitionist, no threat shall on my soul. No perils cause me to desist, no bribes my nets control. A free man will I live and die in sunshine and in shade, and raise my voice for liberty of not on earth afraid. Man of that kingdom, man of that good news, I'm going to Got a robe up in the kingdom, ain't that good news? Got a robe up in the kingdom, ain't that good news? I'm gonna lay down this world, gonna shoulder up for my cross, gonna take it home to Jesus, ain't that good news? Got a slip of in the kingdom, ain't that good news? Got a slip of in the kingdom, ain't that good news? I'm gonna lay down this world, gonna shoulder up with my cross, gonna take it home to Jesus, say that good news. Gonna say the reign of the kingdom, say that good news. Gonna say the reign of the kingdom, say that good news. I'm gonna lay down this world. Gonna shoulder up for my cross, gonna take it home to Jesus, say that good news. Back in time, just a little bit further, it is 
now April 1863, and Frederick Douglass's sons, Charles and Lewis, have just enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts. And the family is hosting a going away party for them. So let's listen in and hear what's going on. I'm glad so many of you have turned out. Uh, some of you, uh, I've cut your hair before. These, some of you gentlemen, Digger P. Morris, in case you don't know my name. I've been out here for a long time working with Mr. Douglas and others, but you know, very special thing is happening today. You are part of the group that's going to welcome the opportunity for two young men from this house, the, the Douglas house, and we hope to win our soul others who will be going up to Massachusetts to join the Lincoln Union Army. I think they call it the Massachusetts 54th Infantry Regiment. Yeah. So uh, we're here to give them a good farewell. Well, any farewell. It's more like a bon voyage. We'll see you at better times. It, it's, it's hard on me because I've known these boys since they were a little bit of trouble. It must be hard on Mr. Douglas. But most of all, you know it's hard on the ladies, folks. Yes, sir. You know it's hard on the ladies. Because, see, they're the ones that give birth to these boys now, men. And uh, I, I, I think I see Ms. Anna Douglas coming up now, along with her friend, Ms. Sojourner Truth. So why don't we just tune, kind of, kind of listen. See how what they got to the minds about that. Sister Sojourn, it is such a pleasure. Good afternoon, friends of freedom. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I bring you greetings from the Syracuse and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church of Syracuse, where I am both pastor and servant. Like the Douglas family, my family is deeply involved in ridding this nation of the sin of slavery. Ridding this nation of the sin of slavery. We don't get together as much as we'd like, but my daughter Amelia and I have come today to join and salute the young Douglas men who will soon be joining other Union soldiers in that Civil War. Frederick and Anna, they have endowed their children, all of their children, I believe his name was McGuire, and he helped Frederick Douglass get out his new faith. We discussed the possibility of war, but neither of us had the idea of when or where it might happen. Now that war is here, he, as I understand and was told today, he has joined a regiment that was raised right here in Rochester, and he is now on the battlefield. This war is being fought so that all citizens may enjoy liberty, freedom, and justice. Please welcome me as I bring my daughter Amelia and Frederick Douglass's daughter. Listen, listen, attention, Tin Hut. I need everyone to be quiet. Now, Charles Rebon Douglas. You're not in the army yet. Yes, Rosetta, we all know you're the big sister. We all know uh, you and Nathan Sprague are uh, fond of each other. But calm down. The train is late, but Lewis and Freddie are at the depot, ready to bring your sweet man right on in here. My dear sister. Please give us some room to navigate before I 
just might have to tell some of your family secrets to Brother Nathan Spray. Well, my dear young brother, I really don't want you to go off to war, but I know that at this time, young men of color must answer that call. So I, I hope you and your brother are safe, and I, I really hope the three of you remain close, oh, but... Oh, we are close. We do all we can to uphold the honor of our parents, and of you too, sis. Now, we brothers have discussed the matter at length and decided mm -hmm. that one of us should stay here to remain close with mother. You see, we wish you all could come with us, but with father on the road with his abolitionist work and mm -hmm. him recruiting for the regiment that we are enlisting in, they're even saying that the government may well commission father to become an officer. What? Father, an officer? You mean the president and the government would commission colored officers? Oh, hey, it surprised me too. Of course it may not happen. A whole lot of white men will have trouble saluting a black man, even one in a Yankees officer's uniform, but, but never mind that, never mind that. Mother, she's the real issue. You know better than all of us how much she slowed since. Annie, right? Yes. Our sister, our dear sweet sister, died, but she remains yet heavy on mother's heart. Three years ago, last month. March 13th, 18. Just nine days before her 11th birthday. The way I see it, our baby sister was the first to go to the casualty. The war just no, started. No, no, no. It's true. According to those political folks, that the war began in 1861 when the rebels attacked Fort Sumter. But there was a whole lot of fighting going on before that because of the government's ugly attempt to enforce that fugitive slave law. But people resisted it. People like your father and our father risked their own freedom so others could get to Canada. I remember father saying, he said that, he said that your father was right in the middle of the resistance. Right, right down front he was, right down front. As a matter of fact, he was in the street with what he called the Vigilance Committee, trying desperately to keep black people to be Hijack back into slavery. You know, it's a wonder they didn't arrest him and cart him off someplace to Tennessee or somewhere. Yes. Yes, I remember that. Uh, I remember when father told mother about that Jerry rescue. Yeah. He said, it slipped my mind now, but I know that <laughs> me, and, me and Freddie were asleep, but Lewis had his big ears wide open. Oh, <laughs> never mind about his ears. Now, I, I didn't get the whole story, but I do remember that the three of them stayed at our house all day on that September 20th day of 1851. And Father himself drove them to Kelsey's Landing and put them on a Canada-bound boat. You see, they had helped three or, or, or I don't know, a, a, a number of freedom seekers from Maryland who had escaped from a Maryland plantation owner, and the owner was trying to get them back. Now, helping them was against the law, and they would have arrested Father, and they would have put him under jail. Father welcomed him as a, as a member of the family, and he was Mother's yes. Of course, Father, he was out doing abolitionist work and doing his recruiting and giving speeches all over the North and South. John Brown, Captain Brown, spent a lot of time with Annie. In fact, they became close friends. Oh, but John, Captain Brown, had bigger plans. He wanted to make it so he could free all enslaved people. Yes, yes, yes. He tried. The very next year, he and a band of men both quit. It seems the fellow also only in part is very We're going to stay here to help her take our money. Douglas men have to answer that call. Colored families have to let their sons and brothers clean. Young friend, I am so clean. I understand that the young Irish lad 
who helped your father get out of the newspaper. Oh, in the proceedings, Jerry, he jumped over the table and he made his way down to the street for Syracuse because he saw the he couldn't run the man. They got him. They put him. Later that evening, some 2,500 citizens of Syracuse gathered in the streets of Syracuse with a battering ram. We knocked down the door to the jail where Jerry was being held. One of the federal marshals, he pow, he shot into the crowd. When we found out that no one had been injured, it made us more determined to free Jerry. One more time. Jerry, Jerry is, is free! He was kind and respectful. Horace McGuire would see freedom seekers all on any given month. 75,000 volunteers. He himself volunteered and trained at a camp along the river. Yes, Horace McGuire, he, he wanted to serve among the colored troops. It was a racist policy. This policy that it's a white man's war cost the North the Union, so many more Union lives than should have been necessary. Now that President Lincoln has signed that Emancipation Proclamation, colored troops will be able to fight in this war. Amen. Rosetta, yes. your father is a man of words and a man of action. He has printed this broadside. Because you are the elder, you shall read first. When the first rebel cannon shattered the walls of Sumter and drove away the starving garrison, I predicted that war, then and there inaugurated, would not be fought out entirely by white men. A war undertaken and brazenly carried out on the perpetual enslavement of colored men cause logically for colored men to help suppress it. With every shout of victory raised by the slaveholding rebels, I have implored the imperiled nation to unchain against her foes, her powerful black hand. Slowly and reluctantly, that appeal is beginning to be heeded. Yes, when this war is over, the country is saved, peace is established, and the black man's rights are secured, as they will be, history with an impartial hand will dispose of that and other questions. Action. 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 Not criticism. Mm. That's right. It's the plain duty of this hour. Who would be free themselves who must strike the first blow? Yeah. Better even die free than to live slaves. This is the sentiment of every colored man amongst us. Who would, would be free themselves must strike, strike the, the first blow. Mm. Better even die free than to live slaves. Better even to die free than to live slaves. That all of our families are sending to this war. Yeah. Lord, we ask that you watch over them. Mm. We ask that you bring them home safely. Mm. The sun the brother, but we ask, Lord, a special prayer that Lewis and Charles be looked over so that they may return to their home, to their father. And let the church say, Amen, 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 Amen. Amen. We're moving into 1864. Before Horace McGuire left for Louisiana, he trained with his battery not far from where we're standing right now at Camp Fitzjohn Porter. His regiment was the last to leave the camp, trailing behind their brethren from the 108th and 140th New York Voluntary Infantry. 
50 years later to the day, McGuire recalled watching 1,000 re uh, recruits of the 140th march down St State Street to the New York Central Railroad Station on their way to war. He wrote, what a send-off they did receive. The side tracks were filled with people, and while the goodbyes were hearty and genuine, one could see that most of the women were in tears. The 140th fought at Gettysburg and several other major battles of the war and suffered some of the greatest losses of any of our local regiments. Indeed, McGuire lost two very close friends. We're going to travel into 1864 now and talk to some, some of the soldiers from the 140th who've just returned to camp after their engagement at the wilderness in Spotsylvania and they're now outside of Richmond, Virginia. How are you doing today? You've had a pretty rough battle. Yeah, um, you just mentioned that there were a thousand soldiers that left this camp in 1862. Um, here we are in fall of 1864 and we're actually in the trenches outside of Petersburg, Virginia, uh, surrounding Richmond. And uh, there's actually less than 200 of us now. Uh, we did cross the Germana Ford, or we crossed Rapid End River at the Germana Ford. Uh, went into battle, the Battle of the Wilderness. We had about 500 soldiers at that particular battle. Uh, we're basically surrounded, and there was uh, less than half of us left after that. Four days later, we marched over into Spotsylvania and made an assault on a place called Laurel Hill. And our colonel, who's a man named uh, George Ryan, he was actually killed there, shot through the breast, uh, as well as our major, Major Starks, who was actually from Brockport. Um, I wanted also to mention this uniform that in January of 1864, the 104th New York was re-equipped as a Zouave regiment, and that's what this particular uniform is. And if anyone would like to take a particular close look at it, it has a French Algerian design. It was uh, considered to be a very um, uh, elite unit to get to be selected to wear those uniforms. Um, <clears throat> also, I was saying, so we, at this point, we are camped around um, the fortifications around Petersburg. It's basically a siege situation now and um, there's really no end in sight for this war. It, the Confederates are on the ropes but we've got them pushed back to Richmond but every time we we try to push them back further Robert E. Lee seems to come up with something and he's got us held here and there's just no end in sight right now. Do you have any sense of the struggles that will face your unit to come? Well. It, it looks like it could be pretty bloody because, as I'm saying, we're uh, uh, camped in front of these major fortifications, and for us to try to storm those, um, it's not going to be a, a pretty sight. So General Grant keeps trying to slip around further south, further south, trying to cut the lines into Richmond, and that's that's where we're at right now. And uh, hopefully this will be over soon, but we can't see an end today. Thank you. Dearest love, do you remember when we last did meet? How oh, you told me that you loved me, kneeling at my feet. Oh, how bad you stood before me. So 
the bend here. Trained at Camp Fitzjohn Porter, which is just beyond the trees from here. It's now the area covered with, with houses behind us. But this was a very important spot in our community at the beginning of the war. So I would like to read you the sign that was placed here. On this site in 1862 was erected Camp Fitzjohn Porter as a recruit camp for Civil War soldiers. Named after a Union general, it was the initial training ground for Monroe County's 108th and 140th New York Infantry Regiments and Mac's 18th Independent Black Horse Artillery Battery. That was McGuire's group. The camp stretched southwest along Cottage Street between Magnolia and Utica Streets. Other camps were at the former county fairgrounds next to what is now Strong Memorial Hospital just across the river and at what is now the Rose Garden at Maple Wood Park at the Wilderness. Lost more men in the equally futile charge at Swansylvania, fought in the trenches at Petersburg, then helped overwhelm the enemy at Five Forks. It too was President Lee's surrender. 1,374 of them died of wounds or disease. Unfortunately, our good friend Brian Bennett could not be with us today, but the historian and author has been a great friend to this event over the past three years, and so he wanted to participate this year as well. And he did so by sharing a letter dated October 1864 that a soldier wrote to the citizens here in Monroe County. I'd like to share this with you. It's been perhaps the most tumultuous year of this war, and its outcome may be determined in the next month or two as Abraham Lincoln learns whether or not he will be re-elected president. If he loses, a negotiated end to the war is likely probable, and all the sacrifices already made to save our Union would have been made in vain. Our federal armies faced a loss of manpower when the original enlistments of the 1861 volunteers expired earlier this year. A good number of men took advantage of the generous inducements and re-enlisted but the burden now rests on a different type of army, with many soldiers having been unwillingly drafted. Our 108th and 140th regiments, regiments who were organized at Camp Fitzjohn Porter, continue to serve and play large roles. Unfortunately, they have also paid the price of a new kind of incessant warfare, almost day-to-day -day fighting in which the men are in constant contact with their enemies, likewise in constant, in constant danger. Both units have suffered heavily, the 140th in particular, losing over half its men in the opening conflict of General Grant's Overland Campaign, known as the Battle of the Wilderness. Officers and enlisted men alike are shot down in such large numbers, and the lengthening casualty list from Grant's army has struck hard here at home in Monroe County, leading our citizens so wary of war to wonder if this can continue. Many of our men have been captive, and since the prisoner exchange system has broken down, are languishing in Confederate POW camps, in which men are starving and dying at a terrible rate. Northerners call for retribution, and more and more civilian property, previously untouched, has become a target for armies in the field. It's an uglier, more brutal type of war. Yet a considerable lift has been given to our forces by the large numbers of African Americans who have been willing volunteers. Many voices have picked up the call of Frederick Douglass, and recruiting is, ha is happening in locales both north and south. The numbers have been so large that the process of rising and training has been taken over by the government. Regi regiments are now designated United States Colored Troops. These men have made it clear that they are not joining the army to dig fortifications or do fatigue duty, but to risk their lives and take part in the fight on the battlefield. African American troops have earned respect for this desire to fight as well as for their performance in battle. Monroe County men of both races have been volunteering. Experienced officers are needed, and so veteran white soldiers are applying for positions in the USCT. One such officer is Horace Todd McGuire, formerly of Max Battery, another Monroe County unit that resided at Camp Porter. McGuire applied to join the USCT and underwent an exam to determine his ability and worthiness. 
he passed and since has been serving with the troops down in Louisiana and Alabama. U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth or under the earth which can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in the United States. It seems that this year has taken us past the point of no return in many ways. Slavery is on its deathbed, and both the Southern forces and resolve are dwindling. The costs of this war have been too high to accept anything but the end of slavery and the restoration of our union. Let us all resolve to see this thing through to its rightful end. It's hitting tonight on the old campground. Give us a song to cheer of the loved ones at home that gave us the hand. Friends we love so dear. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to cease. Many are the hearts that are looking for the right to see the dawn of peace. And sing tonight, and sing tonight, and bring on the old background. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to cease. Many are the hearts that are looking for the right to see the dawn of peace. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. We're tired of war on the old campground. Many are dead and gone. Of the brave and true who have left their home, others been wounded long. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to cease. Many are the hearts that are looking for the right to see the dawn of peace. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old hand. here to perform a cannon firing demonstration for us in honor of Horace McGuire, the U.S. Colored Troops, and all of the soldiers who fought for us in the Civil War. I have to warn you though, this is going to be quite loud, so if any of you need to take this time to leave the premises or cover your ears, please we'll give you a few minutes to do that, and then the cannon firing will begin. Um, that will conclude our event. I have a few closing remarks as soon as this cannon firing is done. So please stick around and uh, enjoy. All right, so now I'm going to walk through and try to explain exactly how I fire this wonderful piece of uh, military technology. Um, this is a three inch ordnance rifle. But it runs off of a friction primer that I'll show you in a second. Um, it's extremely accurate, up to 1,850 yards. So basically, if you can see it, you can hit it. You might miss the first shot, but on the second shot, if you're any good as a gunner, you got it. Um, to talk about the range, if you think about it, if you have a football field in front of you, okay, actually technically you could even go 18 football fields end to end. If you could pick a house at the end of that, not only would you be able to be so accurately fired into which window, but specifically which pane of glass, so which little square out of generally the nine of a Uh, it's pre-moistened to go down and put out any green engine. 
that point, they'll bring it back out. Check the end, put it off, send it back down. You go waiting to receive the powder jar. Advance the round to Chris. Have him inspect. Then the next one. At that point, the gunner inspects around, make sure it's going order, and make sure everything is in good form. And the command ran. The gentleman in the number one position slowly walks around back to the seat of the gun. He's actually going to then make an arm point to the ram head out and then slam it home to make sure it's got a good cat. Now, this is a reenactionism. Uh, they never would have done this actually historically because he then puts the ram head on top of the hub of the wheel. Obviously, if it was a real war, you didn't want him to know that you were ready to fire because uh, you wanted him to walk in. Ready! Uh, once you do this one, I'll go up and show you the next step is actually the fight to time allotment or actually even elevation in the ground or in the air and set a charge that would cause it to explode. That's where you first get the idea of shrapnel. It flies over him and it'll rain down on your opponent. Um, there's a couple of other ones. There's a canister which will demonstrate the crew walk. Advance around. Um, canister was a last ditch effort and oftentimes was not used in a three inch ordnance rifle because it would destroy the rifle. Uh, this actually turns this tube into a giant shotgun. Thank you. You ride everywhere? Oh, Trying to do that too. Gotta get the right gear here. given to fire canister. This should be loaded as safely but as quickly as you can. Typically if we're firing canister, which obviously I wouldn't let my officer let me do that, um, you want to load it as quickly as possible because chances are they're within 75 yards of your piece. Which uh, subtitle, not so good. <laughs>
tells me every time you have my camera. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. How you appropriately call it. And then you What do we do? It looks like you've got a horse and have fun. Now we teach infantry how to fire artillery. This is going to get very interesting. commemoration today of Quaba the Heritage Associates for their portrayal of the scene involving the Frederick Douglass family. The 140th New York Volunteer Infantry for sharing their memories of the military campaigns of 1864. Historian Brian Bennett, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but whose research and writing brought us up to date on the lives of the soldiers who trained here at Camp Fitz John Porter. Reynolds Battery for their cannon firing demonstration. And we also wish to thank the City of Rochester for their event sponsorship and support, the City Parks and Recreation Department for logistical assistance, Sector 4 Community Development Corporation for their technical assistance, John Curran and Staley Stampler for their event planning, members of the Gandhi Institute who have been serving as helpers today, and our sign language interpreter, Jennifer Horak. Thank you all for coming today, and we hope to see you at future events.